so, uh, hi again. Uh, let me introduce our first speaker for today. He's Mark, and um, he's been doing podcasts since before most of us knew what a post podcast even was. In the recent years, uh, he's been paying a close eye at the open source and open culture in, uh, throughout Europe, actually. And he's going to tell us a little something about that. So please give a warm wel welcome to uh, Mark. Hello, good morning. So thank you. Uh, oh yeah, the presentation, you gotta have one of those. Um, so thanks for being here. And I say that because uh, you're brave, you could have kept sleeping, but you chose to be here. You're, you're motivated, that's part of what I wanna talk about today. People like you, the motivated. And if you're at home watching the stream, you're motivated too, you're just still wearing your pajamas. Uh, so are some people here. Uh, so, I want to tell a story, or put many stories into one story, if that's possible. It's a risk, but we'll take that risk together. Uh, all the uh, successes and failures of that I get to uh, either deal with, or you get to deal with. But um, indeed, I've been watching communities, not just open source, or, or whatever term you want to use. Let's talk about terms real quick. I know some of you are very orthodox when it comes to uh, free or open source. I'm not. I apologize if that offends you, and if uh, RMS Richard Stallman is watching, then I guess he'll also be very angry. He'd turn it off instantly. Uh, but I don't mean any offense by that. I think all projects are uh, of value in this world, especially if it gives people more access, more freedom to do things, to, and above all, to improve life on this planet, okay? So we can bo get bogged down in the details afterwards. Uh, but for now, go with me on this. Um, so the story begins a little bit with cities. Uh, it could have been with villages, but it's not. It begins with cities, because there's been something going on for, I'm gonna put it at 20 years. You could probably track it. Uh, a little longer, and if you haven't been around 20 years, well, maybe you've noticed some things changing even just in the last five. I'm talking about this urban plan uh, or this idea of what a city should be, um, because it may seem like a city has always been what a city looks like or more or less how it works is the way it's always worked, but in fact, there was a major change about 20 years ago Actually, in the 80s even, there was a guy named Charles Landry who, who came out and said, um, the best thing for a city is this idea of a, a creative culture. You've heard of this, right? Maybe people point to you and they go, hey, creative culture. Uh, and they're very excited to see you and they, they set up a cafe next to your office and it's very hip. You sit on boxes and you get to eat like it's 1920 again because that's very hip. Um, so there was this idea of creative cities and some very important people did a lot of research into it. Uh, one of my least favorite is on the screen. Maybe not least favorite, I think I'm harsher against another son of Newark, New Jersey, uh, and that's Richard Florida. And you don't know him, but he has had tremendous influence on how your city works, at least how it wants to work, because Richard Florida said, we need the creative class. Dear mayor, dear city planner, dear government perhaps, you need to attract the creatives. And he even broke it down into definitions, which I won't even get into now, because some of it is kind of offensive, or at least, I just, who wants to be quantified? I mean, I can quantify you all, there's this many people, but it just doesn't feel good, right? So I'm not gonna do the quantification thing, but he said, you know, certain types of people, the techies, they're gonna be really good for your city, so you wanna attract them. And he labeled a bunch of others, the artists, maybe they don't have any money, but you wanna have them, because they're gonna, they're gonna kind of inspire other people to do projects that do bring in money. And Richard Florida wrote, still writes books, teaches classes, he's surely a more educated man than I am even, uh, which is not that hard. And he told cities what to do, and cities all over the world jumped. Maybe not in the beginning, but by 2000, 2005, I live in the city of Amsterdam uh, for over a decade now. 
I know that my city falls all over itself to try and be the creative city. What do we got to do? Uh, find a factory, quick. Uh, okay, let's convert this factory into offices. Uh, sure. What was it? A, a school? Okay, the classroom will be an office. And where can the hipsters get the, oh, their coffee? And so this is what cities are busy with, trying to find policies, trying to find places, anything you can do to attract the so-called creative class. Again, under the assumption that if you build it, they will come. Or uh, if they come, money will also follow. And in some cases in the world, that has happened, or elements of it have happened. Um, and there are a few examples in the world that we look at as the shining examples, um, especially in the tech world and the creative industries that have come to, for example, San Francisco. A lot of people talk about San Francisco. I myself have spent zero time in San Francisco. I have to try it sometime. But closer to where we're sitting right now, there is, of course, uh, Berlin. And Berlin has its reputation, especially modern Berlin. Uh, there's tons of history there, but um, as a place that is where the cool kids live. I mean, have you heard about that? Cool kids, the cool kids, they're there. Uh, there's a certain dress code, and we can have a lot of fun with it. I probably try to dress like a cool kid. It's not working, but I'm trying. Um, and so Berlin has this reputation, not only in Europe, but now all over the world, as a hub, as a, a sort of flashpoint for not only creative, if you want to say art, but also creative in terms of developing, developing software, hardware, uh, whatever your project is, bring it to Berlin and you'll find someone else who has the same idea and can work with you. And it's all fine and good uh, in theory, but in, what's always interesting is does it work in practice? And in that sense, Berlin is an interesting example because there are signs that it's working, okay? I'm not here as a city promoter, uh, but I, I just want to sort of point this out. We can disagree on the details later. So you attract the cool kids, you, uh, you get an economic and social heaven of some kind. Whatever economic and social heaven looks like to you, mine looks like that cafe with the picnic tables and, no. Um, so this is going on in Berlin and People around the world are either, well, looking at it and going, ugh, that's weird, or they're going, we want that, right? We want to have something like that. What do they do that we can do? What is it about the way the city is laid out? Uh, maybe it's something with tax breaks. Maybe it's policy uh, somewhere in there. No, no, maybe it's attracting the right companies. No, it's the individuals. I don't know the exact reason, but I do know that something is happening and it's been happening for a while. And as a result, you have these communities. Now, of course, there's the startup community. And in my work, I do get to meet lots of people. Perhaps you yourselves are also in that startup community. Um, but there's also, of course, the open source community. Or maybe I can take the source off of this word and I can just say the open community. And the reason I say that is because I meet people who work on projects that aren't uh, technology related, but they believe in openness, in transparency, uh, in giving people access. And if you ask them about open source, they know a little, but they're not really directly involved with that term. So I, in, in my work, I'll often lump together open source, open culture, as, as we like to call it. Uh, and they're all thriving in this context of Berlin. And of course, it's not only happening in Berlin, there are other cities that are uh, sometimes held higher than Berlin or com compared very often. That's all fine and good. Um, so this is the context. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that it's completely working for everyone. Uh, there's plenty of people who have suffered under this regime of creative classes. Um, and, and many cities don't want to really talk about it, or they haven't figured it out yet, but you notice that people are being pushed out of the center, uh, can't afford the costs of things anymore. And, well, you know, we, we call it gentrification. There's lots of other side effects that come with it. Uh, so it's not exactly a utopia or any of that whole uh, hipster heaven that, that people claim. There's lots of uh, other details to it. But okay, this is the context that I wanted to set. Uh, and the other element that I have to sort of get into for a second, and it's, it's the whole me, me, me thing, so forgive me, um, is the question of, you know, why me? I mean, there's surely a German in this room who's going, why is this man with an American accent telling me about uh, my city? Fair enough. Uh, I have no business, really. Uh, but I've had the pleasure and the privilege over the last 12 years 
uh, to get to know uh, not only the city, but also the communities, because there are many, uh, who exist there. And this comes as, in 2004, I started making podcasts. It was a fun time of experimenting with sound. Maybe you were experimenting with sound back then. We might have seen each other in passing on the internet. Um, and it was all about trying things, recording, uh, sound, interviews, experiment. And the hacker community, the CCC in Berlin, um, someone specifically who now does a lot of podcasting and radio, reached out to me and said, uh, we'd like to interview you about what this is going to mean. What is this? Uh, because we want to do it too. Great. So came to find me in Amsterdam and said, uh, you need to come to Berlin. You need to come to our community. You need to come to Hacker Camp. You need to come to Congress. And so I said, uh, why? And they said, because you're one of us, because you're a media hacker, which sounds much cooler than uh, I felt, and uh, said, well, okay, if you say so. And I went and I loved it, and ever since then, I've always kind of been there. That's the weird part, right? There are lots of people that are much busier in this community that have no idea who I am. Uh, I've sort of been the guy behind the guy, or occasionally on stage. Um, and I'm not so technical, so whatever it is that I'm doing doesn't appeal to you if you're perhaps a programmer. Or, let's give programmers credit, they can be more worldly and want to listen to podcasts and learn about the world when they're not doing programming, or maybe while they're programming. So, uh, this is my place in all this as this sort of person who gets to observe, person who gets to even be a part of it in different ways. Um, I say armchair uh, sociologist because half of my observations are done from my couch, uh, you know, from home. So this is my place in all this, um, and let's get back to the city. So we have Berlin, uh, you know it as this sort of creative capital, creative capital of Europe, Psh, maybe, creative capital of the world, well, maybe I'm overstating it. Uh, but it is a, a epicenter for a lot of people, let's not forget the electronic music people, uh, they want to feel represented, and uh, they're probably not up at this hour, but we got to represent them anyway. Um, so it's a creative capital in many ways, it's been going on for a while. In 2014, the government of Berlin released one of these government reports with a nice cover, I brought it just so you can look at it, and said, uh, hey, we're doing great, as cities usually do, uh, no matter how bad things are. And they released all these statistics about population growth. And most of that population growth was people coming from outside of the city. Uh, but a lot of it is also births, right? Uh, a lot of young hackers growing up in Berlin who were born in the last 10 years. Um, and they said, you know, economically, we've seen this boost because in, in, in association with the, with the population or at the same time as the population boom. And of course, that figure goes up and down depending on the year. And it's, oh, investment, there's this much investment. So they were sort of high-fiving themselves, um, which is fine. And in this context, we've seen uh, besides maybe some money and uh, big names, we've seen members of the open source community also come forward with their projects and be recognized around the world. Or, in a, in a slightly different example, we've seen open source projects that exist elsewhere in the world perhaps coming to Berlin. And I'm thinking here of Mozilla, uh, who now has one of their major hubs uh, in Berlin, even if that's not where they originally came from. Um, and of course, there's a long list of other companies initiatives that have been around for a little while, that are maturing, that have been around long enough that they're starting to have success in whatever success means to them. Uh, that could be reach, that could be uh, financial success. I want to keep it open, right? You, you have an idea of success for your life as you sit here, and it might not be the same as mine, but there's, it's all success, don't worry. Um, so uh, there's this community as well, right? And that's where this uh, logo comes up. Um, a couple of, uh, well, basically a year ago, as a result of all these years that I've been in Berlin, back and forth to Berlin, uh, at conferences, uh, seeing friends as you do here, for example, at Open Fest, there are perhaps people that you saw 10 years ago, 12 years ago, well, I guess we're 13 now, uh, at Open Fest, and part of the joy is getting to see people again. Maybe you don't see them during the year because you hide in a cave most of the year, uh, which is fine. Caves are very comfortable nowadays with all the technology. So, 
Wikimedia Deutschland is a one uh, Wikimedia organization in the world, uh, a particularly busy one. Uh, they have a lot of projects. I couldn't possibly do them justice, nor do I officially represent them. Disclaimer. Uh, so Wikimedia Deutschland is head, by, head up by a lot of people that I respect greatly and kind of know uh, over the years because we're all getting older, right? We find ourselves getting into these positions that we never had before, making decisions over things we never had access to before. Uh, that's one of the funny things about getting older in this community. You start to recognize your friends have power or your friends are doing things, whereas we used to spend so much time just talking about doing things. Um, so Wikimedia Deutschland uh, gets in touch with me and says, you know, Mark, you've seen what's going on in this, uh, in this city of ours, in this country, in this continent of ours. We feel like there's a lot more to be said, not just about Mozilla or not just about Red Hat, although Red Hat is cool. Um, we feel that there are stories that people aren't hearing. Uh, and we feel like a lot of what we do has been in German. Uh, well, well, understandable, uh, but in German. So we'd like to do something uh, in English. And we think it should be a podcast because we love podcasting and podcasting does relatively well depending on where you live in this world. Uh, so let's make it a podcast and let's make it about open source because of course Wikimedia is a big backer of open source development. Um, also feeling like maybe they're not always recognized for that so this is also a sort of uh, side effect perhaps of a podcast. So showcase what's happening here and explore the different areas. We're not just talking about software and hardware, we're also talking about um, design, we're talking about community. Uh, community, I've seen community spaces, community gardens, uh, changing neighborhoods also, so there's a whole element of the development of the city that comes into it as well. Mix it all up and make it into some kind of a podcast. So that's what we've been busy doing and there was this idea, okay, who is this for? We're doing it in English, it's about Berlin, well, it's for you, it's for people out there, be they in Berlin or outside Berlin, who are interested, who are interested about how a city develops, how creativity matures, uh, what kind of collaborations are going on, and of course, also because so much of what happens in Berlin nowadays is a global thing. It's no longer a Germany thing. It's, uh, it's connected, it's all connected. So it's almost silly to say we only focus on Berlin because when you try to do that, you wind up focusing on the world. Uh, and I think that's a, a good thing. So let's reach people that are anywhere. Let's reach them in English. Um, not, you know, not that English is the coolest language in the world. I understand Russian has a lot more expressive words and things uh, I should learn. But um, I mention it because I've, I live with a Russian. But um, so let's do it in English because so many people can use English, right? That's in my podcasting life, I can't tell you about just one segment of the audience. People are so diverse. They speak English as a second language, but they still enjoy getting content, just like perhaps you do, maybe not this talk, but other talks, uh, in English. So uh, that was the idea, and of course, somewhere in there, if we show projects that are coming out of Wikimedia, good, and if not, also fine. Uh, but let's, let's show what's going on in this community because it's something to really be admired. So we, we hatched this uh, Source Code Berlin project. It's been going on for now over a year. And again, it was the idea that I'm going to go out and I'm going to get to interview people. I'm the outsider, uh, which is kind of odd. People always say, where do you live in Berlin? Uh, nowhere. Uh, I can name you five places where I stay. Um, always. Thank you to my friends. So um, it's, it's an interview program. It's about uh, different kinds of community projects, largely open source, a lot of software and hardware, but now it's gone well beyond, including into the political world, because as you know, it's hard to talk about uh, software and hardware these days and not talk about politics. And I don't mean which party uh, is winning against what party. I mean the decisions that are made about what rights you have, of course, especially on the European level. So this element of politics is also involved in this discussion. Uh, what's going on with policy? What's going on with freedoms? And you know this, you, you talk about this all the time in the hallway, I've heard you. Uh, so just to give you an idea, because there's too many programs to really describe. Um, if I think of some of my favorites, then I'll tell you. But uh, of course, we have hardware and software. We also have open data and civic projects. I'm sure you uh, have been following in the last 
it feels like the last three years, there's been this explosion in a positive way uh, in projects for uh, civic good, uh, using data about your city, about your country. Data, some of which that wasn't available uh, years ago, that governments didn't publish, or they published it in a really confusing, obscure place, perhaps, on the corner of the internet with a format that you could never use for anything. Uh, now there's been this push, of course, to get data out in a usable uh, format and to get more data out. So I get to hear a lot about these projects that are having a tremendous impact, including every time there's a, a, any kind of initiative to change the city. Uh, and uh, I've also had the whole cyborgism, which at first I thought sounded very uh, far-fetched, but of course I find out is not that far-fetched. Uh, people are transforming their bodies, perhaps you've followed this topic, uh, with technology, with hardware and software, and they believe themselves cyborgs by the very definition of the word. Uh, so I get to hear about that world, biohacking, using plants, using uh, living organisms, uh, and, and manipulating them in some ways. Controversial perhaps, but very interesting. And of course, education and design, those are really big areas. Uh, open tech school, the school of machines making and, and ma ma, what's the A? I don't know, something with an A. Um, so this whole world of alternative education, uh, places where you can do a course on something as simple as intro to programming to something far more advanced. And you can do it for not so much money uh, and after work, of course, as a sort of thing you do on the side from your life. Uh, and of course design, uh, keeps coming back lately, fashion, the world of clothing. Um, we don't think, maybe we don't think about it so often, but the whole world of design and creating clothing is filled with debates about rights and licenses and how the machine works and do you have access to changing how that machine works. So I get to hear a lot about those initiatives that happen to be either born in Berlin or now having some kind of a hub in Berlin. And of course, as soon as I get into these conversations about the knitting machine and hacking the knitting machine, you start to find out that the ideas and the, the people who are implementing these hacks, they're all over the world. Yeah, they might meet in Berlin for a conference because it's fun and, and there are certain people they want to meet, but it's not limited to, of course, that place. And that's one of the main conclusions here is that geography doesn't matter. You've heard this for years, but I can confirm it. Um, doesn't matter, well, we'll come back to that. So yeah, there's the community element, there's my, my gamer, my gaming hero, because there's a lot of conversation about gaming and uh, uses of open uh, knowledge in the context of gaming. Um, and that's been a topic. All right, so part of the idea here is that I'm gonna tell you what I've actually learned. Uh, so I'll try to be useful. Some of these conclusions may be very familiar uh, to you. That could be because where you're living, you've seen something similar happening perhaps on a smaller scale. But we gotta go over them anyway, because every now and then you may find one that someone's never heard. So, um, yes, great, I really went overboard with my slides here. Um, first question is, uh, what did I learn, right? So, one thing I get to see over and over again as I interview people in their workplace or about their work is that there is this art to work that's developing. I mean, we know that the nine to five is, is dead or dying, not for 100% of the population, but for a significant chunk, right? Again, we may be sitting here looking at each other and neither of us works a nine to five job anymore. Maybe they're not available, that's another thing. So uh, I get to see how people are rethinking their approach to work including their schedule, but also the structure at work, right? How decisions are made, who's in charge, uh, where you meet even. And there's an, an art to it, I find. The people, what they do is not so much about the job, of course. You do what you love, and you do it because you believe in it. And I suppose that's paramount in your lives because you come to a place like OpenFest. Compliment, compliment. Um, there's also the success stories, of course. You find that uh, the community may not be that old, but there are a significant amount of success stories, some of them that are held up very high, and you say, wow, you know, it's, it's amazing what you've accomplished. Uh, I'm thinking here of even not just companies, but I'm thinking of, for example, the hackerspace movement. Uh, I just did a program on the anniversary, what are we at, 20? five or 20, 20th anniversary of uh, Seabase, uh, the, the, one of the most famous hackerspaces, one of the first hackerspaces in the world. And what you find is not that they're sitting around patting themselves on the back usually, uh, but there is a tremendous amount that has been done, uh, that has worked, 
it took some doing, it took a lot of doing, but the space exists and different groups uh, meet there, use it, benefit from it. So you get to hear about these tremendous success stories, even though there's lots of projects that are still only starting now, that, are, that are, have not succeeded, that are perhaps gonna get there one day, but it's impressive the amount of success stories coming out of the city and that I get to hear about and learn about. Um, also, of course, this may not be a secret, but here it comes. Um, a lot of these projects are actually nonprofit. Uh, in other words, the old, this model of you have a job, that's the thing that allows you to pay your rent and survive. But when you're not at your job, where you really want to be is working on the project you love. Now, to some, this sounds like a sad story because you really want to do what you love 24 hours a day, or do you? Uh, so what you find in the context of not just a Berlin, but I think all over the world now, is this whole thing of you, you perhaps don't do what you love all day long. You do something you actually don't like to do. You wash some dishes. Okay, that's not a very lucrative job anymore. Let me do something different. You work in an office, and what you really look forward to is getting home and continuing on on the project that you're working on. A lot of people do this, um, and for some, it's not a, a, a bad thing, it's not a problem, it's, it's doable. Uh, I find in my own life as a podcaster, I do lots of small jobs that I don't necessarily love so that I can get back to doing the podcasts that I love that don't earn me as much uh, because it's not about the money, right? It's for many of us, and it's not been for a very long time, actually. Uh, and also, a lot of these projects have this societal focus. Now, plenty have the idea of launching a business and having profit, right? Surviving, but surviving well. Uh, spreading all over the world with whatever it is that you developed, whatever system. But there's also lots of projects that simply focus on improving society, right? That's a major value in all this. Um, and as I said before, this idea that a project could be based in Berlin, but it is very much global. All right, I'm gonna miss him. Uh, so then there's the question of why. Uh, why is this happening? And here it gets a little more interesting in my opinion because again, I'm thinking of those city planners, I'm thinking of some of you who are looking around in the world and going, where should I live? Where would my skills be most useful? Where would I have fun when I'm not working? Where would I meet the people that, okay, we have the internet, but I would like to meet people in person. And in that sense, uh, this is of interest, right? Because you want to figure out where you're going to make your life and what's the place that works best for you. Well. One of the things I notice, it comes up all the time, uh, is costs. The cost of doing what you love, the cost of living, uh, the cost of starting a business and maintaining one. Uh, what Berlin has that is unique, let's say fairly unique uh, on this continent, is affor it's affordable. It's affordable for what you get, right? There are lots of places that are affordable. We may be sitting right now in a place that is affordable. I don't know how rent is, but food is quite affordable, right? And um, what most people will tell you, what almost all will tell you about why they're doing their project there, why they moved their lives there, you would think it's about how cool it is, and, and, but no, the number one thing is always how affordable it is. And you may already be going, what if that changes? And that is a very good point. Uh, but so for now, the why has very much to do with the value of things, uh, literally, costs. Okay, there's also the access to resources. Uh, now, here I'm thinking more of people. Of course, we can meet and, and discuss, and we do, with plenty of people who are not in the same place as we are. But Berlin has this advantage of being a place where you will be, you will be able to sit with someone who does work that you're learning from, that you want to build upon or with. So there is this advantage if you want to be near the people. Um, that's one reason that a lot of people go there. Uh, and, and again, that goes contrary to the whole idea that, ah, place doesn't matter anymore. It's all about, uh, you know, having access, good access to the internet. I don't know, place still matters a little, I could tell you. Um, there's also this, and we need some kind of a sociologist, psychologist to figure this out, but there's this tradition of engagement, which here it would help if I was German, I think, or maybe even a German can't, can't explain it, but there's this tradition of not sitting back and letting things happen. Uh, it's, it's been something that we admire even in the, um, the world of, 
well, not spying, because that still kind of happens, but in terms of the people who are fighting against uh, all the, the data retention, and well, you know, you watch Citizen Four. Um, we have this spirit in Berlin of it's not okay. Uh, and not only is it not okay, but we're going to do something about it. Now, let's take it out of the national security discussion. On a grassroots level, you have a, a, a spirit in the city that is, I want to see a project realized, I'm going to do it. I'm going to find people who want to join me. And the good news is, if you do have an idea, you'll always find a couple of 20 or so people who will join you. Uh, so there's this great in, uh, tradition of engagement. I've seen it even as a podcaster. Go with me on this. Uh, I produce a podcast. It's in English. Anyone in the world can listen, and sometimes they do. Uh, but the people who most often feel the need to either email me about some problem with my website or uh, donate money, donate money to keep me going, which is an option, um, are most commonly coming from that region of the world. I'm talking Berlin, but I'm talking Germany in general. And there's this tradition of, of acting, of engaging. And, and let, me, let me criticize my Americans, for example. Um, there, I won't see as many people sending money or, or communicating even, telling me what they think of a program, what I should fix. Um, and this spirit, I think, matters uh, because if you live in a community where nobody does anything or you wait for someone else to do something, uh, then, well, that's not necessarily going to be a, a great place. Or when problems occur, they're not going to get solved. And there's a very interesting spirit that I think does exist elsewhere in the world, but it is so concentrated there. And maybe even when you arrive, you start to feel it. And, and that's why there's so many international people also involved. Uh, but there's this great spirit of engagement. Uh, and that, in that sense, I would say, a friend of mine asked me, when is, very religious question, he said, when is something holy? And I said, thought about it, and I said, I think it's when enough people believe that it's holy, then it's holy. You just need a whole lot of people that agree. You don't need everybody, but you need a few. If you alone think something is holy or good, it's not enough. Uh, well, it's enough for yourself, obviously. But. And what I find interesting and why I bring that up is because if enough people believe uh, in the spirit of creativity, in the fact that if you live somewhere and work somewhere, um, good things are going to happen, that you're going you're gonna to arrive at that conclusion you've been trying to get to, um, I think that spirit is kind of contagious. And I know this sounds like some kind of a pep talk. It probably is. But um, that spirit is contagious, and I find that it exists there, and I've definitely lived in places where it doesn't exist. Uh, so if enough people believe that this is the place to be, that this is where uh, uh, ideas go to be realized, then it starts to also become true. Now, I know there's tons of other factors. I'm not even getting into tax code because I don't know anything about it. But uh, the whole belief thing also has some value, and it's, uh, I think it's part of this whole equation. Um, okay, so... What was my do oh yeah, a couple of sort of lessons or or critical um, I don't know what you call these. Let's just go with it. Um, so one thing that you can conclude ah conclusions is that time is limited. And what I mean by that is we know and you know plenty of places uh, where people say oh it's affordable uh, and oh you can set up an office pretty easily. Uh, but then uh, prices do start to go up. And in the context of Berlin, it's definitely happening. We hear all about the real estate market and how hard it is to find an apartment. Five, ten years ago, you wouldn't hear things like that. It's changing fast. Again, because so many people are believing in this thing and, and it's working for them, well, it's working enough. So time is limited because at some point, it's not going to be affordable anymore. Uh, that doesn't mean that all hell will break loose and it'll be the saddest place in the world. It'll just not be what it is. The reason that people want to be there will no longer be value. And creative people, uh, uh, you know, people who believe in projects that don't make them a lot of money but have impact, they will perhaps look to be somewhere else. And that's where, you know, the mayor of Sofia will go crazy trying to bring them in, right? There's got to be a way. Uh, so time is limited. That's not necessarily the, the worst thing ever, but it's, it's a fact. Um, success, you know, that's another thing. Always a risk. Um, the success of initiatives is always uh, great, 
and it allows you to continue your work, to know what you're doing, but there's always this risk of being complacent, of being sort of pat yourself on the back and go, we're the best. We Look what we've been able to do. Look at, these, look at this software that we've built and how good it is. It's always a risk in any context, and I think in the, in the context of one community or one city with many communities, it's a, it's a risk as well, uh, especially as you get older. Also, I find the aging of a community very interesting. Um, you slow down a little bit. You get satisfied, maybe, maybe. Maybe you should never get satisfied. And lastly, um, interestingly, you know, uh, people always say like in San Francisco, it's all about having a business that succeeds, having an idea that makes you money. Otherwise, you're out. Uh, and so profit is, it's important, it's, it's useful. But what I find in so many of these initiatives uh, in Berlin and through doing Source Code Berlin is that the profit motive is not king. It's not the point of people's existence and their work and what they're developing. Uh, it can matter, of course, but there are many, many initiatives that are not about that. They're about a satisfaction in having impact in society or just making your work easier, uh, giving you more freedom, right? The topics that we hear about all the time. I wish I spoke Bulgarian so I could have heard all the times that freedom has been mentioned uh, in the last 24 hours, probably a lot in this room. Uh, because it's important, and in many cases, perhaps it's more important than making money, dare I say. Um, so that's generally my early observations. Uh, it's only a year, although the podcasts for me have been going on for, for much longer, but it's a curiosity. People still want to know, you know, why here? Why this place? What is? Is there any secret? Um, and of course, it's not really a secret, but there is definitely something going on when it comes to spirit, people's spirit to create, to try things, and people's commitment to uh, developing tools and developing projects that can uh, change the world, not just Berlin. Uh, so I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. I'll take some questions, and uh, I hope I didn't confuse you too much today. I hope you feel positive. Please use the mics in the center to, to ask him questions. If you have any, line up. Don't be shy. Hello, I, uh, first I want to thank you for the nice talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and my question is the following. Uh, how did Berlin manage to attract all the cool kids? Uh, you said that this is a complicated issue. Uh, there are many parts of the equation, but uh, you mentioned cost, but cost is well throughout Eastern Europe and Central Europe. Right. And uh, the, the uh, geographical location is, is also nice. I mean, Europe is not that big of a continent. And what do you think was the killer feature that attracted so many people to Berlin? Hmm. Because 25 years ago, correct me if I'm, wrong, if I'm wrong, but 25 years ago, few people wanted to live there. Yeah. Well, uh... So it's probably way too complicated, but I'd like to point out some more things, yeah. First of all, it's interesting, by the way, um, Berlin in terms of location. Not just for Europe, remember that one of the largest populations in uh, uh, Berlin anyway, it's not the largest, but it's like number three on the list, is Americans. Why would that be? Uh, you know, it's not convenient. Uh, matter of fact, airport-wise, it's really not convenient because uh, it's not a central location, yeah? And the airports are hilarious in Berlin. I hope we never lose them as they are, but it should happen eventually. Um, but so, you know, why did the Americans, just the Americans, why did they come? You know, that would, some, many were seeking this freedom, this idea of freedom, which I would look to my Germany experts, is debatable sometimes in the context, the political context of Germany, but it's more possible than in, say, the US. So I think that actually, you're right, you know, the cost of things, if you want to start looking for cheap places to set, set up shop, you can find lots of places uh, more locally to where we're standing right now. Um, so it's not the money only, but it's also this spirit. It's the, the word, I think word of mouth is incredibly powerful and almost hard to stop at some point. Uh, I was doing a project on, on you know, the, the people who are coming, the refugees coming from Syria, and I was trying to figure out, which perhaps we shouldn't obsess about, but how did word spread? Why is everyone so convinced that Germany is the place to be? Why not Norway? You know, and part of it is this, you know, actual communication between people that say, you should be here. Now, I know I'm comparing two somewhat extremely different situations, forgive me for that, but I think that enough people in the world, for example, of software development are talking and saying, 
yeah, yeah, you could do your job from different places, but you really should do it here. Uh, because, and also, there is this element of offline engagement that Berlin does give you. Uh, again, the people that you can meet, but also the fun you can have, the events you can attend. It's, um, I think it's somewhat tempting for people to be there because physical uh, contact with one another actually still matters. Maybe even there's a bit of a renaissance going on, maybe this is an example too, of people wanting to go back to actually, yes, meeting one another. Uh, if they ever left the whole practice. So I think that part of it is um, spirit and idea, an idea that is actually more powerful than even economic logic, although let's not ignore money, but uh, yeah. Thank you. And That's the beginning of an answer. Yeah, and uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Hey there. Hey, uh, thank you for that lovely um, talk, Mark. Um, so I've got a question. Um, at the very beginning, uh, you said that you didn't want to make the distinction, uh, distinction between open and free. And I understand why you may not want to get into that. But uh, since Richard isn't here, I feel like it's, it's up to me um, to, to bring this up. So um, I agree that it can seem quite pedantic, the differences between open and free. Um, but I think there's an important distinction to be made with tools, technologies, etc., that benefit a healthy commons that cannot be then privatized and ones that can. Um, here's what I mean by that. Um, if we have something that's open um, and it's not protected, then it can, let's say I've, I've got a project and I release it under an open license. Um, like an MIT license. Um, our, the community has put a lot of effort into that, for example. And then let's say Google comes along and says, hey, this is really great. We love what you guys have done. This is going to really help us. We're going to put a couple of million uh, investment into this. But it's under the MIT license, and this is really core to what we do, so we're really not going to share that back. They have every right to do that. Uh, whereas with, say, a GPL license, they would have to share it back. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a big difference between say, uh, a Creative Commons attribution and a Creative a Commons attribution share alike. I think the share alike aspect is really important mm -hmm. because that's what nurtures a healthy commons. Um, because open can also, remember, mean privatization. Sure. So what are your thoughts on that? Thoughts? Um, because I want to sort of gauge creativity and people who try something. I, I haven't limited myself to only, uh, for example, free software. Um, also because what you find is, you know, we're a limited community, and, and it grows, thankfully, but there's so many other people out there with perhaps similar intentions, but don't, don't know, don't understand what it is that we're talking about. So uh, my goal was simply, if I want to speak to as many and learn about as many different movements as possible, or not even movements, but, you know, projects, then um, I'm not going to spend too much time, uh, because there is some time spent on this, but worrying or, or checking uh, what kind of, you know, what aspect of openness does this entail. Um, so basically, it's, it's more a question of I want as large a sample audience as possible. I want to learn as much as possible. And as for, you know, the, the, what happens with the privatization and you know, you see plenty of signs of that happening, and I'm sure you've passed through Berlin as well, with companies that are coming in and going, yay, spirit, and setting up the large empire and going, we're here too. And sure, uh, and I, you could say it's all part of it, the, the private sector and the, and the non-private, um, but you could also say this is a sort of colonization, a co-opting where you, you take over uh, now I suddenly thought of the Matrix, it's been a while, but, um, and that could also be happening, and that could also be what's eventually going to change this all and push people somewhere else. And you do start to hear hints of it, people going, I can't afford this anymore, or I don't want to afford this anymore, um, and looking for some other place. Uh, I think the future is rural, but uh, that's a whole other talk. So, um, you know. so maybe we should separate open from something that might be open washed. Maybe. Open washed? Yeah. Um, yes. But still learn from both anyway, right? Mm. I mean, that breakfast with you has taught me that, you know. <laughs> just learn from it anyway and, and see what's of value. So, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Or, or, oh, uh, that's no, it. I violated uh, the We ran out of time. time, so let's thank Mark again. <laughs> um,
we're sorry and we know we're running a bit late and we'll try to make this uh, pause as short as possible and not take the full 15 minutes and try to fit into the original schedule. So uh, please be mindful of that.